Today we have a women in technology advocate, Yvonne Matsk, sharing her journey from being an account manager through to being director of marketing and partner alliances for CDW. She's going to share with us some of the highs and lows and now what she's looking to achieve from a coaching business that she's just started up during this pandemic. Let's hear what she's got to say. So, Yvonne, thanks for uh, spending some time with me. It'd be just be good to understand your career, how it progressed, and then some of the insights that you've got on the industry. Um, so, if you just start, who, who are you and, and what are you up to? <laughs> okay, no, uh, thanks for inviting me on, Carl. So, my name's Yvonne Maxk, and I'm currently the founder of a coaching and consulting business called Kachir. Um, but prior to that, I was the director of partners and marketing for CDW. Cool. And, and what kind of accreditations have you got for the coaching stuff? Like, why would someone come to you for coaching? Ah, so I've just become fully qualified. So um, I have a number of accreditations. I'm an ILM certified business coach. Um, I'm also a leading energy practitioner, which is a tool, a profiling tool, which talks about how you can understand your own dominant energy or like personality type profile. Um, and the final one, which is the one I'm most proud of, which is the um, registered corporate coach with the Worldwide Association of Business Coaches. Oh, nice. Okay, I said I didn't know any of that, but I have absolutely no idea what any of that is. <laughs> <laughs> Neither did I until I did it, so don't worry. <laughs> Perfect. So I think it's probably worth touching on where your career started then. So obviously uh, it, it started out, was it in technology? Was it outside of technology? And then how did it then progress to where you are today? So if you take me back from the very beginning of my career, it was um, working for a very male-dominated car sealants manufacturer, just in, in a sales administration role. And then I progressed through my career very much predominantly in sales um, environments. I think the reason I got into the technology sales um, was because I have a real passion for it. I mean, I was line programming at the age of 11. So um, I'd always been really interested in tech, but I think I got more interested in how technology, not sorry, more interested in what technology does as opposed to how it works. So my real transition into technology sales started at Genesis, where I started as a sales account manager, progressed through an account director. Um, and then over that period, I became a Cisco sales specialist, focusing predominantly just on Cisco technology. Um, from Genesis, I then went to Kelway um, to build their Cisco practice, take them to their gold accreditation. Um, and from there, I progressed from sort of starting as a specialist on the Cisco side to running the whole partner um, and sort of partner manager and marketing department. So quite a varied career, um, but yeah, very enjoyable. Okay, what would you say was the, one of the most memorable moments to date? Well, I've had lots of memorable moments. When you're in IT technology um, industry, there's lots of memorable moments. But for me, I think there's two actually that stand out. One is an individual, which is winning the Kelway DNA Award, which I still have proudly here, by the way. Um, that was my sort of individual memorable moment. But then the most significant is probably when we won our global award for Cisco um, and we managed to compete with some much bigger players in the market so um, that was probably the second and most significant from a career perspective. Yeah cool I think uh, I've got some of those awards as well over there from, uh, from CD, <laughs> well kept one Calway one CDW so showing <laughs> the companies right. Um, when it comes to the, the, the lows as such or the areas that, that we think maybe you've you, you had a mistake and the lesson you learned from it, what, what would one of those be? I think the biggest mistake I've made is trying to be something I'm not. So if I think about my career pre having a child, I was very much like a guy in terms of my approach, very aggressive, very assertive, you know, expected a lot from individuals and I managed like a, you know, in that style. And I think then when I had my daughter, I became much more authentic and was just the real me. And actually 
I was a much better person for it and a much better manager. So I think my biggest lesson is trying to be somebody I wasn't and just being myself, you know, and just being more authentic rather than trying to be somebody I think what people want me to be. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, if you're doing something you don't believe in, right, or you're doing something that, that makes you makes you look back after even like a five minute interval, right, makes you look back and think, hmm, was that the right thing? It probably wasn't yeah. the right thing. And I think if people could, if you, if you think about the conversations you have with your husband, right, and, and your daughter, they're the kind of conversations that you should be having, not necessarily the same type of conversation, but the same kind of demeanor and rapport with the individuals that, that you're reporting into you ultimately, so that you build that level of trust um, so they can bring challenges to you rather than maybe shying away and letting things go from like a blip to a, to a clash, to a crisis, as an example. Yeah, 100%. Um, that kind of thing. Okay, cool. And what would you say is, or if there are any, the sacrifices you've made along the way? So obviously now I'm a mum and last year alone I travelled 12 weeks. That's 12 weeks away from home, 12 weekends. Um, so there's a lot of sacrifices on your family life. Yeah. In, you know, in the industry, if, you know, the more senior you get, the more you're expected to be at various places to represent um, the organisation. But with that comes a lot of travel, a lot of, you know, commitments that you have to make um to the to the business so i think those are probably the main ones that i've had to make yeah and i know when i moved from internal it to doing um consultancy um and i was away five days a week for three or four years non-stop but luckily i didn't have any children i didn't even have a partner at the time so it wasn't too impactful and enjoy it was great i was living living the life I was in a hotel getting fed nice meals all the time yeah Distortion amount of weight, but it was, <laughs> but it, but don't it was we all call, great. don't we all? <laughs> it's, it's, it's great, but it it's not a lifestyle that you can that you can carry on with once once life happens. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that I've learned over the last few years is that at some point you need to take a step back and think, well, what is what is the value? What what are you trying to achieve and why? And are you willing to sacrifice some of those things for the greater good as such? Yeah, uh, and it also comes down to what your your partner. Uh, and and your child would be happy to support you on because if they don't yeah. support you on it, you might as well you might as well stop. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so if um, if someone was coming to join the industry in, in technology specifically, at the moment, and even into the marketing areas or the areas that you've looked after previously, what would be the, the top three tips you would give them? So I'm going to take this as a, a female because um, obviously there's not that many of us in the industry. So my top three tips, well, firstly, you can do it and you can have a career in the industry being a woman. That's the first top tip. So don't think that your gender um, should be in something to put you off having a career in the industry. Um, the second tip is know that you can be yourself as well. Don't try and be somebody you're not. Learn from the mistakes of others. And the third tip would probably be find other people similarly to yourself or that you can go and talk to to mentor or coach you and help you along that journey rather than trying doing it all on yourself. Don't be afraid to admit when you don't know something and go and ask for help um, in those situations and try and look to ask people with more experience or more knowledge that are there to help and guide you along the way. Yeah, no, they're, they're pretty good tips. And I think touching on the um helping others and, and the, the the women in technology stuff um i was speaking to peter van oven uh, the other evening and he's a ceo for a for, for a vendor that does um containerized application delivery and he he's saying that he's just got his stem ambassador um because he, he's doing a lot of uh charity work but more awareness work into schools and he was saying that when he actually started out doing it he was expecting to walk into the classroom to see a, a room full of boys ultimately in school and he said that 80% of the people in the room were female which uh, is amazing which is, which is which great is, news for the future definitely it is the great news of the future I think what we need to do though Carl is make sure that once we get them in there they stay there yeah. which is the next battle so I'm really pleased that you've said that because that's an amazing statistic that obviously proves that people are doing the right things and focusing on the, all their efforts 
on encouraging youngsters into the technology industry rather than just focusing on people that are already at degree level and made a decision about what their career is going to be. So that's really exciting. Yeah, and on that, on that point of degree, actually, I mentioned this the other in, the, in another session. So IBM used to have this massive push that to join IBM, you had to have a degree. And I think it was a few years ago, their CEO made a mandate that they had to remove that from all job applications because it wasn't inclusive. Um, because not everybody has the privilege of going to university. And a lot, a lot of people are academic and they don't really like to do those kind of dissertations and all those kind of things. I think there's a value to university and things like that for specific roles as such. Yeah. And also for social and engagement and building your community of friends and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think, I think everyone so far that I've, I've interviewed as such, I've had one of these sessions with, I think only one of them has actually been to university and they've got pretty successful careers without it. That being well, said, if they could go back and do it, they'd be like, I'd go back to uni- I'd go university if I had a choice. I mean, <laughs> more for social than anything else. <laughs> yeah, so I'm the same. I didn't, I don't have a degree. I never, um, it was sort of, I think it's a generation thing part more than anything as well. It just sort of wasn't a discussion that you had. Um, and I think I've done okay by not having one. But you're right. I think it's great that IBM have made that decision because there's a lot of organisations that still have it as a pre-request on their job specifications, which does put you off. So, um, you know, and it, they are losing out on a huge amount of talent in the market because of that, you know, reason. So it's good that IBM have taken the lead on that for sure. Yeah, definitely. And what would you say um, got you into the industry in the first place? Because obviously you were in sales and, and you, were, you were doing that role and you moved into a, a Cisco specialist kind of role. What? What drove you to do that? What, what gave you the desire to come into technology specifically? Like I said, I mean, I've always loved tech, always. Um, I've always been a gadget girl. So I'm more about, you know, I love technology for really what it does rather than how it works. So um, I remember my first ever job in IT sales at Genesis. And then I first came across Cisco technology and it was all about um, voice over IP at the time. So we were the first ever organization to install a call manager solution. So this was like game changing stuff to be able to contact people from out where you are in the world from the same number was phenomenal. You know, wireless, we put the first ever wireless infrastructure into the tape gallery, you know, to allow people to be able to come in and connect on their devices when they're walking around the museum. Um, and that's what got me ex- more excited about it and more passionate about it is seeing how technology enables you to be able to do so much more. You know, I can run an entire business off of a phone. I'm talking to you over video from our locations, from, you know, we could be anywhere in the world. That's powerful stuff, right? Yeah, definitely. I think the key thing there is, is collaboration. Is that anywhere, anytime, any device to a degree, but anywhere, anytime is the most key thing for me. Yeah. You should be able to collaborate, communicate, and connect in whatever form that might be to deliver the outcome that you're after. Yeah. And that's one area that I think that a lot of organizations before this current situation that we're in didn't necessarily undervalue, but didn't really see the, 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 the true power of, of enabling the connected workforce um, to, to deliver remote working, home working in, in for business continuity purposes. Yeah. Uh, I think that's one area that hopefully is going to see a, a good upturn over the next next year or so. Now people have uh, had to enforce it on their own employees. Exactly. <laughs> So drag them into the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so we move on to like the industry side of it from, from Korea. Um, what would you say is the, the biggest change that's happened since you started? Okay, so I think you know when I started in the industry, it was very much about product and hardware and infrastructure and speeds and feeds and flashing lights and data centers and now that's so not that's less of important it's more about the cloud and you know ai it's all about applications so i think it's moved very much from physical infrastructure much more to outcome based applications that can be delivered anywhere from anywhere yeah and i think we've been having this conversation from a technical side is that IT was seen as the back office, the guys in the basement, the pizza eating guys with food down the shirts and all that kind of stuff, right? To, to now yeah, I've seen a few of those, by the way. I've it seen definitely, them. <laughs> definitely is. But I think in the, in the new age of, of IT service delivery, um, people are more presentable. And 
the scene is more of an enabler to, uh, to a business than, than a, a necessity ultimately to function, um, which, which is great news from, for me because that's what my career is based on. Uh, <laughs> so on, on the touch of the pandemic, um, what would you say is like the, the positive or negative things you've seen happen from the technology point of view during this, this current uh, situation that we're in? Well, from a positive perspective, I've seen much more openness to flexible working. Um, I'm not, I've got a lot of friends of mine that prior to COVID and the pandemic were never allowed to work from home and they have children. So this has forced companies to reassess their technology infrastructure and look at how they can offer more flexible working to their employees. So that can only be a good thing. I think the downside, though, is that people are working a lot harder because technology is more available and people are more available. So there's sort of pros and cons to the, the situation. But I just really hope that we don't go back to what it was before and people embrace this new way of working, even if it's just as a hybrid, you know, and not not necessarily all meetings to be done on video, because it is nice to see people. In certain situations, you do need that sociability. But for the main part, just being able to offer people choice is far better than we've ever been before. Yeah, and, and I agree on that. I think I'm a true believer, and I've said this a few times now, I'm a true believer that an office is required for mental well-being, socialising, all those kind of things that come with it. But then also for people that can't work from home because of space, technology, available funds, their infrastructure like internet connectivity and things. So my internet today has been been going up and down all day but in the end I just tethered to my phone and I can luckily survive but not yeah. everyone has the technical knowledge to do that so I think there's another element I touched on the other evening around the working from home mindset and changing from office space to working from home and one of the things for me is the duty of care that employers have yeah so think about the duty of care of an office you've got desks of a certain height the distances the health and safety rules the type of chairs you've got the ergonomic keyboards the height of the monitors all these kind of things to stop people from ultimately hurting themselves yeah now people sat on sofas in beds crouched over a laptop all day long getting cricks in the neck and all those kind of things. i think at some point if employers want to move to working from home as a primary method because i've heard a lot of organizations closing offices down to save millions and millions of dollars a year and mm -hmm. um, that needs to be reinvested in enabling their employees to work from home safely that's yeah. still, still yet to be seen from my perspective well i i have actually seen it um, um, so Julie Simpson, she runs a channel marketing agency called Resource IT. So when the pandemic happened, straight away, she picked up everybody's office chairs from the office and delivered them to each of their homes. How amazing is that? It's definitely you know, so she, this, is, this is somebody that was really thinking about people's environments and I have actually a lot of friends that work for companies that have either allowed them to buy a decent office chair or have let them take the ones from the offices so I have I personally have seen it um, maybe I'm you know they're quite rare or they're leading the way yeah po possibly and I think obviously I work for CDW as you well know but we got a nice, <laughs> nice wellness package of some very some very lovely smelling uh, stress balls and things um, which come in extremely useful uh, as well as water uh, flasks and all those kind of things to help people stay hydrated and stuff so I think there's different levels of care that the organizations are providing I think at some point I think even if at a government level it'd be nice to see a minimum duty of care that expands to the working from home scenario yeah and I, th I think you know it's not so much about as much physical well-being it's also about mental well-being because not everybody is in a luxury position to be able to have their own dedicated space to work you know, some people are sat, you know, they're in shared accommodation, so they have to sit in their bedroom, which is not good for anybody, especially for them, in a, you know, the younger generation, they just not used to it, right? Yeah, definitely. So if we think about um, technology, what, what technology is taking your interest at the moment, if any? So for me, it's a lot more about the application. So because I've been starting my own business, um, I've been developing my own website. So I've been using Wix, which has been amazing. Um, I love Grammarly. So Grammarly is my new best friend. So prior to discovering Grammarly, I was always very conscious about my writing and my grammar and everything else. But 
this has basically transformed my life. So everything I write now, I just run through Grammarly and it's sort of, and what's, what's great about it is that the more I've used it, the less I need it. Yeah. So I've actually educated myself on, you know, in, in, along the way. So another great app that I love as well is um, Blinkist. Have you heard of that? Yeah. So again, because a part of my course and me becoming, you know, wanting to help people a lot more in terms of my coaching, sometimes I don't have time to read a whole book because it's consuming. So I'll either do an audio book or I'll look at Blinkist just to get the key, key takeaways, which really helps when it's a sort of an academic book, if you like, to rather than having to go deep into war and peace with the book, you can just literally pull out the summary and the, the key important factors. So those are my sort of favorite things at the minute. Yeah. And I, I, I've said this a few times, I'm on a leadership and management apprenticeship with, with CDW and we get lots of academic information on that to read and digest. Just to be honest, <laughs> an, 800, an 800 page booklet on, on leadership styles is probably not something that's going to keep me entertained for a long period of time. So I think the things like Blinkist or even using things like Google Scholar, right, to get that information is, is extremely useful. Google Scholar, I'll have to have a look at that one. Yeah, it's, it's basically Google Scholar is um, it's like the search engine for academic. So um, you can find papers that have been written by other people and um, you can see their take on an opinion or review rather than just having a, a fully accredited author giving you information. So it's quite useful for different opinions and views. Ah, cool. Be mindful though, some of it does cost money. So you'll click on a link and it'll say, please subscribe. Oh, uh, okay. I'll look out that one. Can't afford it now. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to watch my pennies. <laughs> so on, if we think about the areas of technology that people maybe overlook, so like the unsung heroes. So like my example of this that I've been giving people is things like Microsoft Flow, right? And Office 365, everybody gets access to it. And the way you can automate the way that you work if you know how to use it. Is there any unsung heroes in your personal life or in your, your business uh, technology that you think is worth mentioning? Um, Microsoft Word. <laughs> right? Okay. And do you know why? Because it has an amazing dictator tool. And <laughs> I've been able to walk, do my walking and dictate, um, dictate a blog or something else whilst I've been walking through, um, through Microsoft Word. There you go. My unsung hero. Yeah. Dictation. Dictation. Before amazing the into the future <laughs> yes i mean so you know i can multitask it's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> then put it in grammarly and then put it in grammarly yeah. <laughs> auto correct job done ah. <laughs> but what we'll do now is we'll move on to the lightning round um so i'm gonna ask you a series of questions um just answer it as quickly as you can and that will then be a wrap so last <laughs> technology purchase Last technology purchase, iPhone 11 Plus. Cool. And who's your biggest inspiration? In technology? In anything. It's a really good question. I'd say actually Chris Leahy. Okay. Yeah, for, for anyone that's watching, that's current CEO of CDW. I'll put a link to... You know, first female CEO of CW, run doing a phenomenal job. Um, I had the pleasure of working with her quite, you know, intimately when we did the integration acquisition. And I think she's a real inspiration and role model. So, yeah, definitely. Um, what does work life balance mean to you? <laughs> um, so, work life balance means being able to see my daughter, but also have a career at the same time. So it's finding the balance between what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable. So being able to do my job within a predefined set of hours so that when I'm with her, then I'm with her, not still connected to work. Yeah, yeah definitely. That's the problem with being forever connected or always connected, right? Yes. To get away from it. The really good book, actually, um, called Thrive by Ariane Huffington. And it talks, uh, and she talks about being, disconnecting from technology and reconnecting with reality, because no one ever got their best ideas when they were plowing through email. Yeah. Well, and it's awesome. um, and it's so true. It's a really good book, and it sort of opened my eyes to the fact that I was just consumed too much on my device. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and would you say is that is that your favourite book? What is your favourite book? Oh, 
well actually the book i've just read has to be up there i've just i've read lots of books recently but i've literally just finished reading a book called untamed by glennon doyle um very inspirational lady talks about um her struggles as a female trying to figure out who she was and her place in the world but i think because of doing what i'm doing it makes it sort of answered the question for me around why people find strong confident successful women you know quite intimidating it's because we're conditioned to do so yet we find successful strong um guys very trustworthy so and it all it all goes back to how we're conditioned from youngsters to be that way you know women care more about what other people think about them rather than celebrating their own successes so I think it was a light bulb moment went off for me is to really understand why people maybe perceive you the way you are and that's not really their fault it's just how they've been conditioned so at the moment that I would say that's my favorite <laughs> and what would you say the most important thing to you is my daughter yeah and, and, my, and my husband maybe <laughs> second that guy guy, he's important too yeah (laughs) my family you know I think and certain things happen the older you get that make you realize that I think a bit more um but yeah cool and what would be your words of wisdom if it was in a tweet oh my goodness my words of wisdom (laughs) just shows you I'm not very wise doesn't it because I don't really (laughs) have any (laughs) um be your authentic self there you go don't be somebody you're not you know be true to yourself be authentic okay uh favorite song at the moment (laughs) well all i get to listen to is musicals that my daughter plays so (laughs) (laughs) right now it's ingrained in my head which is one of the theme tunes from cats but that's not my favorite song it's just because it's (laughs) ingrained in my head oh I don't know, really. I, honestly, I don't get to listen to anything nowadays other than what my daughter makes me listen to, either on the TV or from her CDs. Yeah, that's, I think the same as me. It's kids' TV themes, definitely. It's the things that are ingrained in my mind at the moment. Peppa Pig. could never get that out of my head. Oh, my God. Whatever you do, don't go to Peppa Pig World because, I mean, it is amazing, by the way, especially for your youngster, but... Um, yeah, that tune stays with you forever. Yeah, I'm, I won't be going, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's fill in the blank. So the new normal is? Being at home. Cool. Must watch TV show? Sunset on Boulevard. Boule- yeah. Cool. And favourite junk food? <sighs> favourite junk food, chips. Yes, good answer. Good old chips. Chips. Perfect. I think, I think on, on that one, that's probably the end of the session. Um, it's been great to have this conversation and, and tease out some of these insights from yourself. Um, hopefully we can do something else in the future. Thanks, Carl. Thanks for having me.